of the Stampede Wrestling Show. Welcome, everybody. I'm your host, Johnny Mantell, and I got Bruce Hart with me on the live tonight on Heartbeat Radio Live, and we want to welcome everybody on a Sunday night. Bruce, how are you? I'm doing great, Johnny. It's uh, uh, nice to hear your voice again, and uh, we got a really special show tonight. We're kind of honoring one of the uh, true legends, a uh, fellow Texan, friend of yours and mine, uh, great Terry Funk uh, celebrating his 70th birthday and uh, Terry's one of the great characters in the wrestling business and one of the most respected guys I've ever known in the business so I'm really looking forward to uh, having Terry on and uh, you know it should be great we got a number of special surprise guests coming on the uh, show one of those guys that uh, has been through a lot of generations and can go back and tell you stories much like you can of of the real men of the past you know and and tells great stories about them and is involved in the stories and he was always different you know last week we talked about bruiser brody and how he always brought a fight to the ring well terry did the same thing but just in terry funk's way terry was sort of from what i'm told uh, one of the uh, inspirations of the uh, people involved with uh, Bruiser Brody, you know, breaking into the business. And, and that's the other thing about Terry, you know, he's one of those guys who, uh, you know, not only attained superstardom and uh, iconic status himself, but he uh, he was one of those guys who started and inspired and developed uh, a host of these really legendary performers, like our old friend Stan Hansen and uh, Tito Santana and, Ted DiBiase and Jay Youngblood and uh, you know Jumbo Taruda and a bunch of them. So, and I, and I think a lot of I think a lot of that generation too uh, uh, were inspired by coming through that territory at times and and being around the the entire Funk family and they learned that business sort of that that old again you know you and I've talked about it that old school way you learn it in the ring and on in the car and in the gym and at the restaurant. It's just sort of a life experience that you learn it. Terry Funk and the guy that he is is one of those guys that if you met him one night in a building or you're in the territory with him, if you showed an interest and was interested, he was going to help and and say something to you and bring that quality to it. Terry Funk's birthday was a while ago, so this show tonight honoring him, the living legend, his... uh uh, birthday's been building up June 30th, so uh, it's been building up all summer. We've cooled it down enough for him to come on and be with us tonight. And, uh, again, I got a couple birthday memos from people that I'd like to get out and read to everybody. So this one here is from the legendary announcer Jim Ross. And Jim says, One of the great benefits of being in the wrestling business for over 40 years was meeting, admiring, and becoming friends with Terry Funk. While some of Terry's friends and acquaintances may think of him as their crazy Uncle Terry, I will always consider Terry a valued mentor and loyal friend. It's sad if one travels through life in the wrestling business that they came, that they can name their true friends on one hand, and I deeply value my friendship with one of the all-time most brilliant performers who has successfully reinvented himself numerous times. I'm a better man for having worked with and known Terry Funk, one of my favorite wrestlers and broadcast partners, where he was so underrated. Again, Jim Ross. So without further ado, we can uh, bring the uh, the man on and then, I guess, start bringing in some of our uh, myriad of special guests. Hey, Terry. It's not my birthday. I know. I I told everybody that. I don't know. I I was trying to tell everybody that. It's not my birthday. You guys are trying to make me a hundred years old before I'm a hundred years old. You know. You know. What I wanted to talk to you about tonight was my real, 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 real 
real, real, <laughs> real last match I got coming up in Japan. Well, who, holy who, 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 moly. That's my real, 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 real last match. And I'm going to have that t- in Japan shortly. Who are you working with, Terry? Well, I'm wrestling some crazy Mexican, Bill <laughs> Mascaris. He's he's uh, he, he's pushing a hundred. <laughs> I'm just pushing eighty. He goes. Uh, That's not miles an hour either. I'm sure it'll be a great match, though. You know who's going over, or is there? Uh, <laughs> he doesn't have to. He doesn't it's have to. Be, uh, it's going to be an amazing match. He doesn't have to unmask if he, he doesn't have to take his mask off if he does the job or anything. I hope. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> How in the hell do I know? Yeah, I, I, I don't know anything about that. About predetermined matches. No. I am a real, 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 real wrestler. On top of being a. Real, 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 real last match haver. I've had about 15 last matches now. I'm very <laughs> proud of that. It's more last matches than any other wrestler ever in the world of wrestling. What do you think and about it, that? Every one of them a uh, f- five-star match, too, I'm sure. Well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that. <laughs> some, of them were si- some of them were six stars. What? I, I remember that. Stars. There was, uh, they were a few of them were six stars. I would never want to say that they were all five stars. No. I, I remember that one of those last matches. Uh, I think was it a six star? I think it was at least star. six, maybe five and a half, right. uh, down in Los Angeles with that it's Rob Black and uh, Rob I, I can't Black. remember. I haven't thought about yeah. Rob Black. What did he do? He did something with all those pretty girls or something. Oh, I think he was doing some uh, X-rated whatever. Stuff or something, yeah. Yeah. I wasn't you any part of that. I think that you might have been a little part of that. <laughs> I remember you guys knocked down. They had a big facade at XPW. Uh, and, uh, they had all the preliminary matches. Uh, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was you and Sabu were supposed to be in the uh, main event and uh, some kind of a hardcore match. And they had, they had all these little little fat guys that looked like they'd never been in the ring before having barbed wire and thumbtack matches and fluorescent light bulbs and whips and swords. And, and, they certainly uh, didn't know what they were doing, though, did they? No, and I remember you and we, Sapu finally came out the arena, there. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, uh, how do you follow all that <laughs> other crap? You know? but uh, it was pretty easy. That was simple. And I think you guys that knocked the simple. facade down and, uh, you know... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, I, yeah, I remember that uh, sort of one of the uh, more bizarre elements of my career. You know, it was, uh, I think in the uh, L.A. Sports Arena or wherever the hell in the uh, s- slums of L.A. or whatever the hell. You know, but, but <laughs> when did you last work with uh, Mascaris, uh Terry? Uh, Nineteen twenty-two. Oh, <laughs> he was a veteran then, wasn't he? <laughs> Yes, he was. Yes, he, he was. Uh, my third year in wrestling at that time. Yeah, I think he had predated Hackenschmidt and Koch, if I'm not mistaken. You know, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> strength of Lewis. How's was, everything uh, going with your family? Oh, not too bad. You know, um, no real soap opera, so that's good. You know, it hadn't really. That is good. Yeah, I've is. made the National Enquirer or any of that lately. So that's. That's good, you know. And, uh, we had a bit of a run on some of the, uh, you know, kind of salacious stuff there for a while. So, but yeah, everything's going pretty good, and and uh, everything's good for you, Terry. It really is, you know. Is uh, just would love to live to be 105, you know, but uh, only if my wife lived to be 106, you know. It's just uh, I've That's got a nice all, way to it, put it's it. A yeah. It's a wonderful time in uh, in the world for me. It really is. I enjoy every day. I enjoy getting up. Uh, and your I enjoy daughters my are doing life. well. Stacy and Brandy. My daughters are doing well now, and Stacy and Brandy are doing great. You know, and uh, uh, how's Junior doing? Are doing good. Junior's you talk- doing okay down there in Florida. 
Oh, you know, that's good, and, you know. Um, um, yeah, you know, so everything's going good. And as long as it goes like that, you know, as I'm I'm here for the duration and going to enjoy it. I've told you that before, but I've never met a nicer bunch than the Funks. You know, you guys are sort of the uh, the very uh, top of the ladder as far as class and uh and what you well, brought into this business, you know, so including your dad and your brother. So. I appreciate you saying that, and the feeling is mutual about the Hart family and the Hart clan from Canada, and you guys were just special to me and uh, a special part of my life. Your father was extremely good guy to... Yeah, and I, I, I always thought I always thought he and uh, Senior were along the same lines, you know, the same cut of cloth. You know, they were sort of guys who they came up the hard way, and they were kind of pretty legitimate uh, wrestlers and had a lot of respect for the business and for the guys that they brought into the business. You know, and, and they, most uh, of all, and most of all, they had they had that respect for each other. Yeah, and uh, you know. Uh, I know it meant a tremendous amount to Stu and my mother when uh, when Owen died. Uh, you and Dory were up there. That that really uh, meant a tremendous amount uh, to them. You know, it, uh, it's one of the things that kind of gave them a little bit of kind of comfort or something during that hard time. You know, and you guys were well. Really I wouldn't like have been a, anywhere else. You guys were like a pillar up there uh, during that time. It was a Pretty damn tough time, but uh, yes, it was. But yeah, I know uh, Owen and Brett and all those guys. So they all, uh, I might uh, let the listeners know they they all we used to make these visits down to uh, Amarillo every summer and uh, (laughs) impose ourselves on the on the Funk family. (laughs) Yeah, we. And Brett and Owen and uh, my brother uh, Dean. uh, You know, you're always down there and uh, hobnobbing, and uh, we were sort of like white-eyed marks at that time, and uh, you guys were sort of our heroes, you know, so it was like a real... Uh, but it, well, we it, loved it, you guys, because we yeah, loved your it, family. It made a great uh, impression on Brett and Owen. They uh, sort of their first inspiration in, into the wrestling business, and I, I think it, uh, you know, uh, went a long way to help helping them become the workers that they became, you know, you guys are sort of like their, their idols and their heroes, you know, so I know that uh, they would both tell you that too, so, but yeah, it was, uh, you guys were, uh, you know, amongst the uh, very cream of the crop in wrestling annals, you know, uh, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say a bad word about any of the funks, so, you know, it speaks volumes about what you guys are about, so. I I would like to, uh, Reverse that a little bit. Is never loved anything any more than to come up there and uh, be with your pop. And yeah, and it was and always his, uh, and his entire family from your mom to each and every one of you kids. It was it was it was just a wonderful time for me. It was uh, very 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 wonderful to see your family like it was and. Uh, how close and tight knit it was, and that's the way the wrestling business used to be. You had a place to stay, or you had somebody that was going to be a mentor. You had somebody that was going to help you make sure you were going to be okay. They they weren't going to leave you out to dry. And that's when I started. That's how everybody treated me when I came in. And whether it was Absolutely. Vic Rosatani, whether it was Vic Rosatani or or Terry Funk or or you know, or or Dick Murdoch brought me into his home a couple times. It was they they, they weren't going to leave you out to dry. They were going to make sure you were going to be okay. And that and was inst- a they, different uh, time that, when that happened. They instilled a lot of uh, great characteristics in you and values. You know, like uh, all the guys that we were talking about uh, that broke in in Amarillo were beyond being great workers they all they all had a lot of integrity and they were good people you know and you see them outside the ring and they you know were like brothers or you know they do anything for you and and uh 
you know, I think my dad had similar guys up here that he tried to, you know, he'd stretch them in the dungeon before they maybe were allowed to get in the ring. But most of them had pretty good, uh, you know, kind of respect for the business. And, and uh, they had a lot of character, you know. And uh, I think that's an important thing that uh, I, I honestly don't know whether it's, you know, uh, that good in the business these days anymore or not. I, it's a different type of character in the business these days. And But, yeah, all those guys that came out of Amarillo were, uh, you know, uh, guys that everyone respected throughout the business and, you know, still do, still do you know. They, it was almost like a badge of honor if you, you know, were broken in by uh the funks, you know, it kind of like... Uh, or the hearts, or, or wherever it might be. You know, you were constantly being observed if you were a wrestler coming into an area. But what were they observing? They were observing to see if you did have integrity. And that's yeah. uh, very true about the past. You know, it was, uh, it was a bunch of guys that... Uh, uh, had their own rules, but their values were quite high. Yeah, it was a lot all part of the, than what a lot of people would expect. Yeah, it was hey. a part of the uh, obligatory uh, dues paying or the initiation to go through those places, you know, and uh, like Geigel and uh, Von Erickson, similar, you know, they used to, uh, you know, kind of you know, endeavor to make sure guys had some integrity and were, you know, uh, respectful of the business and respectful of each other and all like that, you know, and uh, I don't know whether that's the case anymore. There's, you know, I don't even want to dis- get in, digress into a, a dissertation no. on the state of it today. So Terry, if you don't mind, I'm going to go to the phone line right here. I think I got a caller calling in. Hey, welcome. You're on Heartbeat Radio with Johnny Mantell, Bruce Hart, and the legendary Terry Funk. How are you tonight? I'm doing great. Terry, how are you doing? Doing good. Who's this? Meltzer. That's exactly who I thought it was. <laughs> what are you up to, Dave? I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm actually watching TNA pay per view from Japan. Is what I'm doing. What I'm doing well, right you now. You are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. What have you been up to? Uh, just normally, you know, following wrestling like usual. Yep. Just uh, doing yep. a lot of history. Doing actually, I've been doing a lot of studying, believe it or not, the last couple of days on the uh, '60s and '70s from like '60 to '85. Just uh, well, going through all kinds of all kinds of records. You know, just a lot of uh, just interesting stuff in different places. And you know, it's funny when you look at like uh, how much you know, and you know this, and you guys are probably talking about how much wrestling there was, how many guys were wrestling. In that era, in that era, like early '80s, my God, look at all those places between you know Japan and Mexico and Puerto Rico and dozens and, and you know a couple dozen territories in North America, um, and and so many of them doing really good business all at the same time. At the same time, and yeah. if you add up, if you add it up, each and every territory, because there were I think thirty some territories. Let's just say thirty some all the way across the United States and Japan and, and uh, wherever else that you wanted to bring them in, Germany and England or whatever. But if you added them all up, you know, as you you had about, uh, you averaged, and if you averaged, if you just averaged uh, 800 people a night at each of those places, you'd be doing more business than they are today. Way, 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 way yeah. more. I mean, there were absolutely, yeah, man, absolutely, way more. There were, there and was, what, yeah, yeah. There were, there were, there were arenas, uh, you know, in Memphis and and Mexico City and and Tokyo, where I'm guessing that in just in just those cities alone, they were doing probably half of what uh, we're we're doing, you know, or almost probably, probably just under half of what we're doing worldwide today. It's it's actually yeah. amazing when you look back at it. And the other main thing. Yeah, and you look uh, back at St. Louis. Look at St. Louis, what it was doing. Yeah. Look at New York, you know. New York was doing great. And uh, you're developing a hell of a lot more wrestlers. Every day was a sellout. And there was way more wrestlers being developed than there is today, too. That was Well, the there's other. so many. I mean, like, like if you look, 
there were there were so many different guys who could headline and draw top money all over the world. I mean, it's it's you know instead of like you know four or six, if, if there's even that many. I mean, there were you know I don't know what the number was, fifty, seventy five. But I mean, if you look, and and there were the guys that were traveling everywhere, and uh, I mean it was. You know, it's it's funny because if you really look at those those, those you know different eras, but you know, I, I I mean, again, that whole period where you wrestled, you know, through '85, I think it really was a tremendous, you know, and and, and wrestling is good now. It's a different business in the sense. I mean, it's a, it's a great living. It's just fewer jobs, but and you know, feast or famine, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so there's a lot of guys who want to get in, and a lot of guys are in at a certain level, but it's hard to it's it's hard to make it. If you make it, if you make it, you're doing really good. You're right. It's feast or famine. Whereas then it may not be as much of a feast, but there were, you know, so many guys and, and, and really good, you know, if I remember back at those guys, really good workers, really good wrestlers um, that, uh, you know, and, and also, you know, they're more, more varied. You know, I mean, it wasn't everybody, I don't well, say everyone the same, but you, you learn different things when you went from place to place. You learned a little that bit. Was part of the, that was part of the beauty of it back then is every territory had a different style, so you'd get a guy from Amarillo that and you bring a guy in from there and they would add flavor and we'd send a guy like Dynamite Kid down to Portland and he would add a flavor and then you'd bring in like David Schultz and Honky Tonk from Tennessee and they would and I think that was that's one of the things that's missing today you know you had all these guys from England or Japan or all the different places in the states and they all sort of had a slightly different working style you know in some cases a radically different working style but it really uh kind of uh made the the brand of work sort of a uh, hybrid you know and uh i, I think mean, you, that's one of the things you, that's you missing know, today uh, you, you had that I'd up like there you know where with, with all those guys from england and japan coming over to go with your own style and 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 those guys you know that that came out of your area, you know, so many of them learned that different style. So when they went, I mean, they 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 you know they were so oh, far ahead. Hot, of, uh, they were yeah, ahead of a lot like of the pack. Oh yeah, you uh, you know get some guys like Dynamite and Davy, and they would kind of pick up some of the stuff from Schultz or Ron Starr, the Japanese guys, or Bad News, and then and. Uh, they would uh, some of those guys would pick up the English style like Brett Nolan and Ben Juan Pillman and those guys sort of picked up a lot of those different uh, bit of the English a bit of the Japanese a bit of the uh, maybe even the Maritimes uh, those guys like Leo Burke and them had a pretty good style you know and uh, it, it all uh, made for a, a pretty good hybrid that's that's one of the things I think these days you know they're, they're all sort of coming from the same kind of uh, place and, and staying in the same place. So at times I think you get a bit of uh, stagnation, you know. It doesn't really change that much, you know. I'm, I'm glad to see the last few years they've had a few guys coming in, like uh, CM Punk and Daniel Bryan and a few of them from some of the indies. But uh, aside from that, most of them are sort of coming from the same basic uh developmental background or whatever, you know, so it's, it's tough to uh, create that artificially. You know, uh, the one thing that I'd like to say, Dave, is that uh, to the people out there is that uh, I didn't ever go over and talk to somebody on the other side. Uh, the matches were predetermined, but uh, the match was not predetermined. I'd walked into the ring and uh, all over the United States, and a lot of other wrestlers did the same thing, walked in the ring and walked out there and went to work. I remember my dad used and to say, Terry, that you know. And and created a pretty good novel without all of this uh, predetermined uh, my dad used to say you never see any paint-by-numbers paintings in any museum, you know, and that was his way of... Uh, true. Yeah. You know, uh, and I remember when you or Dory or Harley and guys like that would come up here, and in most cases you guys had never even uh, seen these guys before you came up here, and uh, you guys would go out and have 60-minute five-star match and tear the house down, you know, and uh, it was just all improv, you know, and uh, kind walk, of... Walk into uh, 
walk into the ring with a total stranger. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, uh, all you had was a finish, you know. And pretty well uh, with them, and they danced pretty yeah. well with me, too. Somebody just give you the finish, and uh, you'd say, how long do you need? And you'd say, oh, 50 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever. And uh, next thing you guys were out painting this tapestry, and everyone was, like, uh, on the edge of their seat, you know, and it was... Yeah, uh, yeah some guys painted tapestry. <laughs> Other guys did. <laughs> I see I've seen some pretty, uh, excuse my language, but... I'm sure you're doing a bit of, uh, you know, Picasso or, you know, a yeah. scream or whatever the hell, you know, you know it was abstract uh, art yeah. at times. You know. I've seen a few kindergarten specials, too. <laughs> what, <laughs> Wait, what have you been you up know, to, Dave? Yeah, just uh, nothing nothing big house cauliflower alley this year. It was good. Yeah, it was good. I mean, I enjoyed it. It's uh, it's a little uh, it's a little different every year, you know. I mean, uh, I enjoy it because I, I enjoy JJ and and doing a few things with him out there. And uh, hopefully the the cauliflower alley uh, comes along and does very well. I heard you're going back to Japan in December. And, well, I think I am. Yeah, I'm. Uh, <laughs> wrestling a newcomer in the business. I uh, think it, uh, it's Mill Masters. Really? Yeah, we ought to have a good match. Oh, my God. You you probably haven't wrestled him in, in 35 years, 30 years. No, maybe. no, 30, 35 years. I'm going to beat him up, too. I'm going to beat him up fast. <laughs> I can't wait to get – I finally got somebody that's at least a couple of years older than me, and I'm going to – I'm going to beat the shit out of that old man. <laughs> I'm just a kid, you know. <laughs> Is he going to hey. unmask if he does the job, Terry? Or? Uh, I'm going to take that damn mask off of him. Poor it's over hey, there. hey, I got to I got to step in real quick. I'm sorry, I cannot uh, I cannot go any further. I got another <laughs> caller, Terry, that I got to okay. bring on real quick. Terry, I got another caller calling in. I'm going to the phone line right, right but now. But it's not my goddamn birthday. Happy birthday, brother. <laughs> and this and this ain't and this ain't Hulk Hogan calling, brother. <laughs> <laughs> it's that limousine riding, jet flying you, you son a, of a bitch that drove you around job. the Carolinas, asking <laughs> you when I was going to be the world champion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and how much it? longer did I have to wait? <laughs> All right, who is it? It's that guy that it's that guy that in 1972 went to Whiskey River with in Amarillo for the Christ sake. Who else did that? <laughs> who in the hell went with me and said it's not Ray Stevens? <laughs> yeah, it's Rick Flair, you idiot, for the Christ's sake. Flair, what are you doing? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, you put that brother shit on me. You put that brother shit on me. And it's not my goddamn birthday. <laughs> what the I hell, not, man? Everybody's trying to make me older than what I am. It's not my birthday till till June the 30th. 70 years old? And I didn't know you were 70. I thought you were my age, man. I'm a, oh. <laughs> well, Jesus hell, I Christ. am. I, I'm sorry. I've been lying about it the whole time. I'm your age. I'm 74. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> How you doing? Where are you, man? What have you been you... doing? What in the world have you been doing? Oh, man, I've been sick. Believe it or not, I got sick. First That's time in my in life. California. No, I'm in uh, I'm in uh, Atlanta. I got sick up about a month ago, man. I was in the hospital for 11 days. First time I... I've been in a hospital since I was in the airplane crash. It was brutal. But I'm good now, so up and what running, ready wrong? to go. What was wrong? Oh, she, I was driving down the road, you know, and you know how we are, right? I, I had a stomach ache for about three days, and I just thought I, you know, ate some spicy food or something. And uh, so it, was, it hurt so bad on a Monday night and a Tuesday morning, I went to the hospital. At about nine thirty, and the guy, I thought they would just give me some medicine, right? Christ, an hour later, I was oh. having an emergency appendectomy. I, my, I had a ruptured appendix, been ruptured for two days. I was driving, you know, I didn't, I didn't even know it, right? So, uh, 
I just that, thought they'd give me some uh, medicine. That's unbelievable. That's a terrible no, I know. thing it's to a, have. He died yeah, well, that, li- Rick. No, well, listen, man, I know so. You know, we just we get immune to that kind of stuff. So uh, I went for the surgery. They took me right up to the emergency room, never even checked me in the hospital. I went right to the emergency room, and, and they woke me up, and they were, you know, sewing me up and all that. And the, the guy woke me up and said, uh, man, while we were operating, I knew we, uh, we, you had a hernia. We got a hernia that started because it was so bad. So they put me back to sleep, and shit did a hernia operation on me, real similar to what happened to Roman Reigns. Uh, so, yeah. you know, after that, I stayed in the hospital a couple of days, and, man, I, I'm not kidding you, Terry. I haven't hurt that bad in a long time. I, I've never been that sick or upset, right? So I go home, and I'm home for four days, and, you know, I just couldn't go to the bathroom. I couldn't eat. I was brutal, and I went back. And I had bowel obstruction. I had a, uh, an obstructed bowel. I had to operate again. Well, wow. three times in eleven days, Jeez. man. So, oh my God. anyway, I've been out. I've been out. I've been out uh, three weeks. Yesterday or Thursday, so I'm knocking on wood. Screw it. But that was brutal. I told that people is. to take the airplane crash, take both rotator cuffs. When I had my back, you know, name everything. Nothing was as bad as those eleven days. Holy shit! So anyway, I'm 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 good now, though, man. Everything's good. Well, you just didn't you just have some kind of intestinal deal last year? You told me about when I saw you in uh, where did I see I you last? Know. San Diego, I've, right? I've had, I've had so many things done to me. I can't even get them yeah. in the right order. You know, as yeah. I had 18 inches of gut. Yeah, put something in, you told you know, me that. Yeah. There. Yeah, they went ahead and took out 18 inches of my gut. And, Oh, I don't know. I've oh man, I, I, I tell you, a, I, I had a heart stent I, put in. You know, had a heart. Oh, stint. I didn't know I'm, that. I'm, yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually the six million dollar man. I think. Yeah, you are. Well, God bless. Yeah, I tell I you what. Um, I'm. I, and I, I haven't just had to pay wait. for any of it. Yeah. Well, I didn't have to pay for mine either. Thank God. Six. I, thank I got God. Medicare now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I got. <laughs> I got Medicare now, man. Yeah, I got that. I've, hey, hey, Rick, I've had that. I'm, I'm fixing to retire with that too, with 20 years in that. Yeah. Oh, God. No, I just. Uh, I'm fixing to have 20 years in Medicare. Oh man, I tell you, I, I just had you know, you just we we take so much for granted. I, I don't remember of all the stuff that's ever happened. To airplane crash, rotator cuff, I mean, nothing laid me up as bad as this. I mean, I just. Ugh. It made me, it gave me a whole new perspective on life. I'm not kidding you, man. I'm going to start donating time and going and see people in the hospital when I got free It'll, time. He <laughs> oh. gave you a whole new so, perspective and a new whole perspective. Whole new perspective. I, I had never, you know, I've been at my, on my parents. Perspective. <laughs> yeah, boy, just take life for granted. Forget it, man. Whew. Yeah. I was sick. Whew. I mean, it, it was major. I just... They put that tube down my, my down my throat three different times to drain the bile, you know, because I couldn't. Uh, Chris, I didn't eat for nine straight days. I went. To, I lost twenty pounds. <laughs> I couldn't oh, believe geez. it. Yeah, geez. yeah, it was brutal. So, geez. anyway, knock on wood, I'm up and running, man. That's great. Working out. Going. I'm going to RAW tomorrow. <laughs> I am. There, I am. I have. I have been working out very, very hard lately. You have been? Doing, and I'm not, oh, yeah, I have been. I've been hitting it. Yeah, well, it's, it's I don't important. Wanna, the, the one thing I don't want to do, I don't want to uh, be an idiot and uh, go do something like I'm going to go over there to Japan in a couple of months and uh, work a match. And I don't want to be an idiot and go in there in uh, bad shape and have something happen to me. I want to be for certain that everything's right and I'm in the right condition yeah. and everything. Right yeah, well, I don't blame you. I mean, you know, we just, we yeah. take it for granted, I guess. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know how many times I've said to somebody, you know, uh, thank God for good health, but man, I'm, I, I'm a, I say it all the time, now I live it. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I live good health. Oh, yeah. uh, God. You know, yes, you, that is true. We all, we all it say that true. to our friends, you know, thank God for good health, right? Uh, Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. I'm knocking, I'm knocking on wood as I say it right now. <laughs> 
look at Harley's been through hell. I mean, I just look, you know, I just yeah. you look at the the cast, the guys around us. I mean, you know, do you, do you even where um, you guys are in Calgary, and you're not Terry, but this the show's in Calgary, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I see your brother all the time, man. He can hardly walk now. What the hell? He's yeah, got he's, a bad uh, back yeah. and bad knee and a bad hip or right. I mean, I, I see him. It just yeah, amazing. Yeah, I, I think even that. I even think even that stroke took some toll on him too. You know, he's made a pretty good recovery, but you know, one one thing after another, you know, and uh, yeah, you're looking good. I've seen you on TV a few times, Rick, and uh, looking good and uh, still uh, styling and profiling or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Man, I, I I gained the weight, but I lost all that, and then I you know I was I was really in good shape for this happened because I WWE didn't think I could pass that heart test, you know. So I I said, okay guys, give me a month to get ready for it. So I really got myself in good shape and uh, went to Pittsburgh for that physical, you know. But I had to pass, so I could mm-hmm. bounce around in the ring, and everything was great. I mean, I couldn't have felt better, and all of a sudden. Uh, you know, I, I had just gotten back from Australia and SummerSlam, and uh, I was going back to work, uh, which I am tomorrow, actually, and uh, all of a sudden this happened. So and then I got out, and the same thing happened to Roman Reigns or something similar to him. You know, he didn't have the appendicitis, but uh, I don't. If they think Reigns is going to be back in three weeks, they're they're crazy. That ain't going to happen. He had he had something really. He had that. He had a, an impact to hernia in his uh, intestine. It was really bad. Yeah, I wouldn't rush him back if I was them. I, I'd, uh, well, he he, can't, he yeah. won't be able to do it. You don't heal up like that. Your ab, your abdominal area is not, not it, something it, that heals up like your ankle or your back. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. You you can't rush stuff like that. You might be risking something more serious if you. Well, you you, you know. depend on your stomach for everything. I mean, you know, whether you're sitting up, even taking a bump. I mean, you know, you know, things we just take for granted, but you're midsection or your core is what, you know, it, it's, oh, hell, it's yeah, very, that could be, very uh, pretty serious if something, you know, ruptures or something and you're uh, in the middle yeah. of a match, you know, you might be putting your life yeah. at jeopardy. You don't like to say yeah, that. He's lucky that he's lucky it didn't happen in the ring. You know, <laughs> he, he was, he, well, they, well, they, they knew he had a hernia, but they didn't know how bad it was. That could have happened in the ring. And like you said, Rick, it, it's, it's the core of your body. It's not like you can tape something up or, you know, do something about it. It's the core no. of your body. There's no well, way to, you guys. to stand and proceed and move forward, and especially as, as hard as that big kid works. Uh, uh, yeah. Th- there's no way they can rush him back and do anything with that yeah. kind of injury. Guys, I couldn't, I could not get out of bed. I, I didn't take any painkillers home with me because uh, they make, they give me anxiety, and I didn't want to you know, have that problem going forward anyway. But I couldn't get out of bed, man. I mean, that, when I was in the hospital, they had to help me out. But when I got here, I couldn't get out of bed by myself for three days. Did and, you drop I mean, any that, weight, Rick? Yeah, I went from two thirty eight to two uh, two twenty. Wow. Well, yeah, I'm back. I'm back to about two twenty six. I'm gonna stay right here. That's where I wanted to be. So you're feeling uh-huh. pretty good, though. I feel great. Yeah, but I can. I still oh. know that I'm. I still know my abdomen. My abdomen is sensitive. But I have to. I have to wear this thing around my waist uh, all day long for another four weeks. So I won't be taking any bumps for another four four or five weeks. Um, That won't hurt my talking ability, just giving these guys a hint in case they want me to talk tomorrow night. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, know, Rick, Rick, you said said that. We everybody everybody that's listening in tonight they they send me notes through the chat room and stuff. So since you said yeah. that talking, let's get a good story, a good Terry Funk, Ric Flair story. Oh, I, you that, know my my is, is there one my we can talk about? <laughs> there are none. You know that's you know I've learned that you know as a, you know let me tell you <laughs> as a guy that probably has more stories out there about him than anybody, being myself, I don't tell stories about you know people say. Tell me a Roddy Piper. I don't have a good one. <laughs> I mean, I I have a lot of good ones, but I'm saving them for my new book, which I'm writing. So uh, I got a lot of Trey Funk stories, but I can't tell them. I mean, it's you know he won't be able to he won't be able to, if, if he's home he won't be able to go into his bedroom tonight. I'll he'll get locked out. I'll get in trouble. <laughs> that's, you know. that's exactly right. Yeah, I, I just don't tell them. That's the truth. People say, people yeah. say tell me a Terry Funk story. I don't have one that's audible. I mean, you know, that <laughs> we can air. I don't have a Roddy Piper story we can air. It's just some people that, 
Now, I can tell I can tell you a Ricky Steamboat story or a Sting story, but Terry Funk, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's enough of the stories there. We don't want to talk that's about it, that's the right. stories anymore. Yeah, we want to get away from the story subject. Yeah, <laughs> the only the only story I can tell you, the only one I'll just tell you part of it is we were coming back from Raleigh one night, and uh, Greg Valentine just bought a brand new old '98, and he was all dressed up. It's so like I got Greg wearing suits and all that. We were tag team partners and. For 140 miles, all Terry did was light Valentine's hair on fire from the back seat. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the story about, I won't tell you. <laughs> what about your pit bulldog? Yeah, I'm not. Well, I was going to tell that part well, of the story. Well, you had the pit. You had the pit. And then yeah, but I wasn't going to tell that I part. I went ahead and says, "Go ahead and growl at him, Terry. Go ahead yeah. and bark at him." So I got yeah. down on the floor and. Uh, Growled and barked yeah. at the dog, and Rick let the son of a gun go, and he uh, yeah. latched onto my nose. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's he not exactly it, but nose. there's more to it than that. But the end of the story ended up with my wife taking all my stuff, throwing it in the front yard, <laughs> telling me to get out of the house, and me and Terry <laughs> driving. Which I don't. I told him. I told him last time I saw him. <laughs> We we ended up at a hotel ten miles from my house. We, I woke up in the morning. And I have no idea how we got there. My El Dorado was there, but I can't tell you how we got there. Well then, Jesus. well then, I, 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 I'm going to sneak. I'm going to sneak in and I'm going to sneak in and say one thing. Earlier on, Rick, we were talking about the business and 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 back when and the guys and and everybody involved and stuff. And 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 I'll say it here tonight. I was never in a territory full time with you or Terry, but any time I was around either one of you, the the class and the quality of the person and the 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 come over and talk to a young kid and help and discuss stuff with him and 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 try to push him on the right way, you two guys oozed that out the entire time that I was ever around you. We tried, you know. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. it, it was fun back then. Now you can't. Now you know if somebody asks my opinion about something, <laughs> and I tell them they get mad. But we you know what? How do you feel about helping the young guys? And that's one of the questions. That I said I got no problem helping them. But if I find out they ask somebody else what they think of what I asked them, <laughs> they're done. <laughs> so, and that's how it happens. You tell one of the young kids something, they ask you, and then. Five minutes later, he's go. He's over in the corner asking some kid his own age, "Hey, what do you think about what Flair told me?" <laughs> Forget that shit. <laughs> That's the last yeah, time I tell him anything. <laughs> yeah, there was never any. There was never any comeback because, again, when when I was around both of you all traveling back in the late seventies and early eighties, anytime I was on a card with you, if I asked a question or you saw me do something out of place or needed correcting or needed a comment. There was never a reluctance in comment. There was always a straight answer and the truth and, and moved on right down the road. And for me, a, a guy that came through the business and got to see a couple different generations in this business, it was very much appreciated because both of you all yeah. were very always honest and upfront and spoke the truth to me, and, and I always appreciated that. Well, no problem. You know, I don't... I I don't remember giving anybody any advice when I was younger. <laughs> I was having you know, too much fun. That was the wonderful thing about riding down the road, though, you know, is get those young guys in there, shove them in that back seat, and educate them. That's the yeah. same way we came through the business. It was a different era, always... a different time. Uh, who has the best workers, uh, the present day, or or did we? It uh, They have tremendous workers now and uh we had tremendous workers in our time but it was two different complete ball games than what it is today they got a shorter yeah. attention span today than they've ever had the audience does mm-hmm. than what what we have well, it's, 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 it's a different business you know it, it just is different it, it's, business. It's not, right it's not fair to compare anymore it's not fair to no yeah it's, it's, it's not even fair to analyze it because um Apples and oranges. I, 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 it's apples and oranges, but the guys, I mean, they still they, they they work as hard as they can work. They 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 do the best they can possibly do. But so many of them don't have the opportunity to learn 
and that's about the, 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 what they're you know, what they're attempting to do before they're put you know in in the spotlight on Raw. And you know, it's like I said the other day, you know, in, 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 in Raw right now, and as it has been for the past fifteen years, you know, you're you're only as good as your last quarter hour, brother. I don't care who you are. That's it. Yeah, That's most of them. Foster the Rock, man. When they put you out there, <laughs> it's like Back in the day. told me in nineteen seventy eight, you got five minutes to show them why you're different. That's it. Back in the day, you had all these and, places and you know, to learn Rick, how to work. I truly feel that the uh, audiences and uh, you know, from television to home to wherever it might be, and anything has uh, their attention span is is uh, greatly shortened compared to what. Well, it, it is greatly really shortened, but it's because you know they when they. You know, when when we were in our heyday, they just were coming around with these with these TV changers. You know, with the ability to change your channel. Now yeah. I sit here and I watch TV. I've been watching more TV in the last three weeks because I've been laid up and I have more. And I can't watch anything for more than a minute. Even when I'm watching no, I along, I go back and I go back and forth from one match to the football game. You know, yeah, which everybody else is Me doing too. too. And That's and what uh, I'm doing you know. Too. Yeah, and then, then I, I don't watch network news because I want to commit suicide if I watch that. But I do, <laughs> I, I do bounce back and forth on sports. <laughs> network news will put you into depression. I mean, <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah, Ebola are cutting people. <laughs> oh my God! For, uh, race See, I don't care if it's CNN or Fox. They will both depress you if you watch it. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Let's not talk politics either. That's another bad subject. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of information, though. <laughs> well, Terry, wow. listen, man. Happy birthday. I think the world well, is Well, thank you, but it's, uh, my when birthday was again? two months ago. Two months ago. Well, I thought I had killed it was a while ago because I, yeah. we talked about but it. But I am going to have, uh, I want to have my, Rick, I want to have my last, 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 last. With one more last, and what I mentioned earlier on this show, match with you. Oh, let's do it, man. I'm ready. Right now. Well, I will be ready. For, give me two months. <laughs> uh, I can uh, well, we take I I a better backdrop than anybody on Raw because nobody takes them. Maybe WrestleMania. Maybe WrestleMania. I just want someone to take a backdrop on TV. What's that? Maybe next, next WrestleMania next year might be. Uh, Flair and Funk main event or whatever. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it, that's I don't think it'll happen. be any worse than Brett and Vince. I, so. It'll be, it, it'll, it, it'll be, uh, it's, it's a nice thought process. But I'd just be happy if Terry and I are there for the Hall of Fame banquet together. <laughs> that's hey, all I, I need. Enjoyed it. Hey, that's all I need to be there. Yeah, uh, when they I'm bring uh, it too. the year in Houston when uh, Terry and Dory came and they got inducted and, uh, uh, they brought their wives, and uh, Harley was there, and uh, I wish, I and mean, I don't quite understand how they do it, and I'm sure the company can't afford to bring everybody, but there's just X number of guys, in my opinion, that they're, it's just fundamental, and that they should be at every WrestleMania. I mean, that's, I mean, at, at every Hall of Fame, too, you know what I mean? I, I was I just mean, going to say that it's a wonderful thing, that, uh, you know, I really am thrilled to death about being a member of that Hall of Fame. That's just the coolest and, thing in the uh, world. I mean, when they got to you guys, that was so damn cool. I mean, think about yeah. this, guys. Jack, Jack Bristol got inducted when I did in 2008. And, you know, six months later, Jack was dead. You know what I mean? Well, right. that, was, that, that was Jack and Jerry. The year that they inducted me, they inducted Jack and Jerry, Gordon Soley, and Eddie Graham. And both, or, both Gordon and Eddie had already passed. But Jack, yeah. you know, had been sick and had the emphysema and all that. And six months later, after Jack, or maybe eight months, Jack passed away. And hell, Jerry's had four heart attacks. So, you know, you just never know. It, it's a, uh, it's, it's a pretty, it was a pretty wonderful thing. And you know, as I'm going to tell you something too, is the, uh, you know, there's other Hall of Fames in the country too that I've been honored by, and and I take every one of them as uh, so seriously because. Uh, is I love the recognition from them, you know. Well, there's but, uh, nothing like having a recognition of your peers. I mean, they have the guys that yeah. you're either, even, I mean, your contemporaries and then the young guys that have them respect you is, 
It's so cool. It's I mean, a wonderful you know, guys thing. It. It, is, it is. Yeah, it's a brotherhood. It's, been, it's, yeah, it is. It's, it's, just, it's a different brotherhood than when Terry and I were riding up and down the road, but it's, it's still a brotherhood. And, uh, you know, the yeah. guys, I hope that they look at it like that. It's, you know, it's an experience. There are so many guys out there. I mean, I can I can go anywhere. As I'm sure Terry can, but I'm in Atlanta now. And there's always some guy that was a wrestler. This guy said he knew you. I mean, okay, tell me about it. You know how many wrestlers there are that have never wrestled? <laughs> Walking the streets of Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> you be kidding me. <laughs> They're walking in Dallas and Chicago and Calgary and New York. Oh, but and Memphis. They're walking all over. Of, yeah, but Atlanta because of that because of the uh you know, we had W C W and N W A was here for all those years. Uh, Atlanta is full of guys that's <laughs> full of wrestlers, you know what I mean? Rick, how about my my uncle used about, to wrestle you? Who? <laughs> what was his name? Joe oh, yeah, Bob? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. I say, Yeah, I remember him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Hey, you just got to go with it because you won't win the arguments. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> they got a day and a place in the city. <laughs> the hell? Oh, God. Well, life is good, guys. I got to go to bed, man. Well, I, I got to get up. I appreciate you calling, Rick. Oh, hey, Terry, I love you, man. My best to Vicky. Love you, too. And I'm sure I'll see you, you down the road. Man. And thank you for having me on the show. We got to get together again. I love it. I actually... Uh, here we are. Yeah, and, uh, Fred. yeah. Fred I, I, after all these years, our text buddies. Who ever thought? Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I uh, appreciate your coming on. It's an honor, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, I'm honored too, man. You guys I, have a uh, great night, okay? Two of two Thanks, of the, uh, the all time greats, you and uh, Terry. So it's. I'm, oh, thanks. Uh, Anytime. Now, listen. I remember when all you kids used to come to the NWA convention with your dad to the place. Oh yeah. yeah. It's a Back, uh, <laughs> you were about, oh, you were about uh, twelve years old. <laughs> yeah, the Von Erichs and the uh, uh, yeah, like, uh, Nicholas yeah. and all those yeah. old farts. <laughs> well, listen, guys, you have a great night, okay? Yeah, get Thanks, well, Frederick, and, uh, Rick. and okay, hopefully bye, Terry. You, you and Terry bye, at Terry. WrestleMania next year, one final farewell or whatever. <laughs> Send that over to Vince right now. <laughs> bye. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, the legendary, the legendary Rick Flair on with us tonight. Thanks, Rick, for being on with Bruce and Terry. You're listening to Heartbeat Radio Live, and I've got to go to the phone call. Uh, we want to thank Rick for being on with us, but i got another caller calling in. I believe it's J.J. Dillon. J.J., how are you tonight? It's Johnny Mantell, Bruce, and Terry Funk. Hey, how are you doing? Terry, happy birthday. It's not my <laughs> damn birthday. <laughs> what, 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 I can't believe it. Counting or what? It is not my birthday. <laughs> when is your birthday? You Educate. guys are all trying to make me older than what I am. <laughs> I took the bait. They said it's Terry's birthday. And never, and uh, wouldn't it be a nice gesture to, to have a tribute to him and everybody calling and wish him a happy birthday? And so I went for the bait. Here I'm wishing you a happy birthday, and you have no idea what I'm talking about. Why, hell no, I don't have any idea. <laughs> what you talking about? What have you been up to, J.J.? I've been listening to you, and I've been listening to Rick, and I've been listening to you talking about having uh, another match. And I'm just thinking to myself, well, Terry's already retired. Well, yeah, he's retired numerous times. <laughs> he He retired, <laughs> and then he... Yeah. Retired again, and then he had to have his American retirement, and then he had to have a, a retirement uh, for Texas, and then yeah, and he had a retirement for Amarillo, and I guess you forgot Amarillo's in Texas, and then Japan, and now I hear that you're wrestling Milmas Caras or something yeah, in Mexico. Yeah, I guess right. you need to retire in Mexico too. Well, you know, as I got tired, well, I got tired again, so. So I retired again. <laughs> you, you've had you've you you've had so many surgeries and so many parts of your body replaced. You're like the bionic man. You're good for another hundred years. You oh, you'll be able to make a comeback. So. Yeah. I so. No. I hey. So. I wanna I wanna live to be 105. I said that earlier. 
Well, hey, if five. anybody can do it, you you could do it. I mean, that, I oh, I want to do it. I want to live to be 105. And I, you know, and, and listen to Rick, and I'm thinking, geez, there's here's I'm listening to two guys that were both NWA World Heavyweight Champion, and you are unique in that you and Dory Jr. are the only two brothers to both be NWA World Heavyweight Champion, and that's an incredible honor because. For me, that title meant something at the time, and it still means something today. And it I've does. got a replica of that belt that you wore on my wall. And, and if you remember, I, I had asked you to sign it, and I, and I have it. I have it up. And that belt meant something to me, and it, and it meant something to the fans, and it meant something to the guys that were in the dressing room. We looked up to, to you, and to Dory Jr. and to Ric Flair and to Harley Races. As guys in our business that were that were special, that were uh, a notch above everybody else. Absolutely. And and all of you, yeah. And JJ, you 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 had a replica of it. Whatever happened to the real one? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, that's a I good don't question. Know either. That's a, that's a big that's a that's a big question. Whatever that's happened to mystery. the real one? And the real, real one, one, based on the weight of this one, yeah, that, that, I'm trying to think of how much weight the gold must have been, and even though seven, the value of gold down pounds. a little bit, how much? Over seven pounds. Seven pounds, even at, I can't over calculate seven that pounds. high. <laughs> that Sixteen was, ounces was, a pound, that'd be about a hundred and some ounces. Of gold yeah, well, we have to we have to eliminate Giant Baba. Uh, uh, who sadly has passed on because he couldn't have put that much gold even in all his teeth, or Andre couldn't have either. <laughs> I wonder who has all that gold. I don't know. Somebody got it all. <laughs> Somebody got it all. No, I think it was. Honestly, as I think it was four and a half. It was uh, wow. it was four and a half pounds of gold? It's still a lot of gold. Oh, an incredible amount of gold, and and it just kind of disappeared, and all of a sudden it was uh, smoke and mirrors, and there was another belt that looked exactly like it. Yeah, <laughs> hmm. yeah pretty amazing. So, so, when is your birthday? No, it was, it was two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it, was, it was June the thirtieth. June the thirtieth. My, yeah, that's only four days after my birthday. How can I have forgotten that already? I don't I'll know. have to write that know. down. Me June plus four is is you. But you know I what? Know. If you have and celebrate birthdays the same way you do retirement matches, you'll celebrate 70 forever and never get any older. Uh, <laughs> that's a good idea. That's a good idea. You know, but I, I don't mind getting older, though. I want to be 105. I feel sorry for Vicky having to put up with you for all those Well, yeah, years. that's it. Because I want her, like I said earlier, I want her to be 100, live to be 106. Yeah, maybe if we could find all her. that, if we could find all that gold, we could have like a crown or a tiara made for uh, for Vicky for putting up with you all these years. She certainly deserves it. Yeah, <laughs> she does. She certainly does. <laughs> well, this is good. I, I, I'm sorry that I'm late, and whether it's your birthday or a tribute, just the fact that you're on the line and, and a chance to, to be included in. It's a, always good talking to you, Double J. Yeah, we, you know, you're probably the guy that I'm closest to in the business. Uh, it took me a while to figure it out, but. Through all of the years, you were the one guy that always was ahead of the curve in terms of seeing where the business was going when nobody else could see it or figure it out. And I've yet to see a situation where you miscalculated or were wrong. You've seen where the business uh, has gone. And I, I, I heard the comment that you and, and – or a little bit mini discussion that you and Rick had about, you know, who's the better, you know, performers, you know, today or back in the day – and I think the and you you talked about attention span, which is true. And I I do the same thing. I sit here and watch a show that I enjoy, and the minute the commercial comes on, I go somewhere else, and a lot of times I I forget to come back. So I am guilty of that too. But the one big the one big difference 
is the era that we came from, and I don't care whether it was Amarillo and I. I, I, what is the population of Amarillo? 125, 150,000? 175? It was. It was then, JJ. It was then. Now it's about uh, 260. Okay, but back in the day, it was uh, under 200,000, that's for sure. Yeah. And the, dif- the difference was the mindset that we would be there on a, uh, a Thursday night at the, at the old Amarillo Sports Arena that's not there anymore, and then we would go to TV Saturday, and whatever happened Thursday night and however we followed it up on TV that Saturday morning, determined how many people were in that arena the following Thursday. And so we, we couldn't afford to do anything to insult the intelligence of the people. And what we did, the emotion, and a lot of the things that I think are, or that I see anyway, in my opinion, that are missing today, were critical to that era because we needed all those same people to come back. And hopefully they would tell somebody else, boy, you really missed Thursday night, that match with Terry Funk and whoever, and or Dick Murdoch or Ricky Romero or whoever, and uh, and and get people to come back. I mean, that's how how we made our living. And and these guys today, you know, if someone were to ask Ric Flair his opinion on something, and then go ask somebody else that's a young guy what they thought of Rick's answer was. I'm astounded to think that their minds would even work that way because they go to a town and then they don't have to come back to that town for six months, a year. year. And and Never. so if they do something stupid or the show's a stinkeroo or whatever happens on the TV in between is not interesting, it, it doesn't have the same impact that it does with us. And that is a huge, huge difference. Yes, it's apples and oranges, but we had to get those people interested and keep them interested. And families came and had the same seats every week in Amarillo. And as the fathers got older and brought their kids, those seats were passed on and other family members took them. And that's how we made our living. And it's something to, I think, at least for me personally, to take great pride in that we had the ability to do that. I definitely believe that it uh, has to be the way that it is because it's what uh, sells the tickets. It's what turns the turnstile. That's what wrestling is. So it has to be the way it is. And what they are doing is the right way. But I liked our way wonderfully. And our way was, uh, uh, it was not total choreography whatsoever. It was just Get in that dad gum ring and uh, away you go. Yeah, and, 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 and I can't I can't imagine also with I and I and this is not uh, being disrespectful to somebody who's had tremendous uh, respect yeah, success. in Hollywood writing movies or writing plays or writing television scripts, but how can someone hand a Terry Funk or a Roddy Piper or a Dusty Rhodes? or a Ric Flair, a piece of paper, and tell you what they think their impression of your character would say. The reason that you were so successful, that, that you were Terry Funk, that the, the Dusty was the dream and, and Flair was the nature boys because you went out there and Rowdy Roddy Piper, that you didn't even need the bullet points is what to say because when you're going from week to week, it was all mapped out. You knew before you went out there what you had to talk about to bring those people back, and then you interjected your own personality, your own character. How could somebody well, else be better than what Terry Funk is? And and they do it now, like you say, because they have no choice. They have no talent depth. It has to be the way it is because all they got is what they got to work with. They're like puppets well, on the string. My job. You guys have heard this. Many, many times. But what was my job? What exactly was Terry Funk's job to do? And Terry Funk's job was to put a butt every 18 inches in that arena. And that's what my job was, and that's what I did whenever I got on the microphone, or Rick did. 
that's what that's what we intended to do was put a fanny every eighteen inches in an and, and when the bell rang, that was the, the the goal in mind without somebody saying so it was understood that you went out there and gave everything you had because that in conjunction with what you said on the interviews were what gave those same people the incentive to come back and see you next week and the week after and so forth and so on. Exactly. And you were, you were always have been and always will be one of the best. And I respect you. I, I love working with you. I love the fact that I was in the business in an era where I had a chance to experience that and be, and, and be a part of it. Well, I loved every one of you guys that are, I loved everybody in the business. I truly did. You know, I mean, uh, there were some guys that, uh, hey, this or that. But uh, I just loved the business, and I loved the people in it. And And the other uh, thing that you said. It was my entire life, and the thing that I've said since I've been a little bitty kid, you know, since I've been six years old. You know, what was my dream? My dream wasn't to be a cowboy. My dream wasn't to be a... a policeman or a, a teacher or a scientist or anything. My dream was to be a wrestler. You wanted to follow in your father's footsteps because Absolutely. he was successful and that's what that's what you wanted to be. And the other the other thing that you, you kinda just brushed by but it's true, all of those trips that we made together, uh you know, and it wasn't the same guys in the same car. And you went from territory to territory. It was different people. But in those trips, you know, yeah, we might talk about, uh, you know, other things. We might talk about politics or who who thought uh, some girl sitting in the audience was cute. But before too long, what we were talking about, we were talking about the match we had that night or the night before or what could have been better or if we got back in the ring next time, what we would do different and ideas got thrown around, and the business was better for that that conversation. And like you said, take the young guys, put them in the back seat, and educate them. And, and when I first started in the business, that's what I did. I sat in the back seat in Charlotte where uh, Johnny Weaver was there and Art Nelson was there, and I sat and I listened because that's how you, that's how you learned. And, uh, very, very true, JJ. I remember the one time you came up to Calgary back in the early '80s uh, with your old buddy Leo Burke and all, and uh, yeah, and Sakurada. Great... I came, I yeah. came back from Japan, and I always felt that my career would never be complete without coming through uh, Calgary. And I came mm-hmm. there not by accident, but by design. And I had a chance to go to your home and get the tour. And I, I remember looking at the big pictures on the wall of all you guys, all you kids when you were young and the big staircase and going down to the dungeon that's been talked about so much. And, uh, oh, yeah. There, and you were, a, you were a, a student. I was in awe of what I was. I was in awe and uh, thrilled that I had a chance to to be there and to see the place that I heard so much about. And that was... Uh, yeah, and that and was I, and my, it made a great impression on my dad because you were... Uh, very highly respected guy in the business at that time, you know, and uh, my dad was quite impressed, and he, he uh, I know he uh, spoke about it for years after, and he always uh, had high regard for you, so I, I'm really delighted. That I, I appreciate it, and I was glad to know uh, he and Helen, your mother, too, they were they were wonderful people. I'm not going to hug up the whole conversation. I, I just wanted to call in and say hey to you, and uh Please, uh, send Vicky my love, and, oh, and, and I look much. forward to seeing you in Las Vegas. Well, I'll be there. All right, we're going to do CAC one more time. Terry, see you down the line, my friend. Good night, right. JJ. The Heartbeat Radio now is going to the phone lines, and I'm bringing on the legendary, the world champion, Harley Race. Harley, how are you tonight with Bruce Hart and Terry Funk? Fine, my friend. How are you, Terry and Bruce? <laughs> Great to hear I'm from you, Harley. Uh, this is a uh, grand slam here. This is like, uh, you know, saving the best for last, the king. So uh, I uh, can't tell you how honored I am to be talking to uh, Terry Funk and Harley Race at the same time. Yeah, it uh, doesn't get any better than that. 
You're talking to two of the all-time best. I, I would like to say one other thing. <laughs> they threw away the molds. <laughs> yeah, they, they aren't going to be any more like these two. That's for sure. No, you can say that again. Just being on the air with all of you is a pleasure for me. How have you been, Harley? Uh, physically, I'm uh, halfway decent anyhow. Got a couple, three or four things wrong, but uh, hell, that uh, is, is time catching up, right? You're, you're still in KC area, Harley? Or? No, uh, I'm actually closer to the St. Louis area now than uh, than Kansas City. A um, little town called Troy, Missouri. Let's ask Harley if he's got any advice for Terry. Harley, did, did you hear that Terry's getting ready to go back to uh, Japan and he's going to wrestle Mil Moskris? <laughs> well, if he does, uh, it would be a hell of, a, hell of an event. <laughs> it's going to be a it's going to be a hell any, of an event. That's that's a good way to describe it. It's going to be. Do you a have hell any of an uh, advice for the rookies there, uh, Terry or Harley? Yeah, I'm the, the advice for, uh, I'm the rookie. I'm the Bill's rookie. Bill's been in the business in. longer than me. <laughs> of the rookies coming in or the ones that have been in and going out? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good one. Oh, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> You're talking to two of the all-time best. The very best. Tell me, Harley, when did you and uh, Terry and have your first is... match? Oh, had our first match. God almighty, I can't uh, even know. remember. Can you? <laughs> no, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, Who went over? Sure. <laughs> well, I, I, I can remember sometimes we go in the ring and just beat the hell out of one another. And to come that, back, and my father would go ahead and come back in there and scream and holler at us <laughs> and say, that's enough of that crap, wouldn't he, Harley? Yeah, so he yeah, that's... He not doing that anymore. And you had to get pretty damn physical to go ahead and have him say that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> pretty hard to make him say oh. that, but he did. I can remember going to Clovis, New Mexico, and uh, wrestling... Uh, 60-minute broadways with you and uh, going to Littlefield and Abilene and going an hour or going close to an hour. And every night seeing you give those people that paid an admission, gave them their money's worth. I learned from, from you, from my father, from so many other guys in the business that you go ahead and you give those people their money's worth. And if you give them their money's worth, they'll come back. I remember one and time, Terry, uh, we had this screw-up on the, down in uh, Billings, Montana, and uh, somehow there, my brother Smith took the uh, ring to the wrong town. So they ended up, uh, they had no damn ring, and we had a sellout crowd there, and Harley was world champion at that time, and I think he was, had to work with Jake Roberts or something like that, and and everyone was saying, "Oh, we're going to cancel the show." And Harley said, "Like hell, we'll." Uh, and Harley went out and had a five star match with Jake Roberts just on the damn floor. Do you remember that, Harley? Yeah, I remember. Uh, and my dad I, meant a, meant a hell of a lot to my dad. Like uh, you know, here's the world champion, uh, uh, one of the biggest stars in the business, and. All the other guys are saying maybe we should cancel when Harley steps up and says uh, the people are here. We'll go out and give them their money's worth. And uh, you were taking the backdrops and all the other, you know. And, uh, I, I promise you that Harley Race never cut any fan short. They yeah, always no. got their money's worth whenever he is out there. Yeah, they got you the know. same out of you, Terry. They got the, well, yeah, they and, got and, the and, same out of you. Yeah. And I seen Harley go ahead and go into the ring with, you know, have a bad snowstorm or something, and and seriously been there with him before on those kind of things. Have 150 people in the audience, and he go out there and give them 110 percent. He knew that they 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 those hundred people paid to see him, 
just like the, if you had 50,000 people out there. And I learned that kind of stuff from Harley. Yeah, I learned it from uh, my father, you know. I mean, that's something I learned from them is you you go out there and you bust your ass for those fans. I remember and Harley he giving that lecture did. to Brett and uh, Dynamite Kid when they were rookies up here and uh we had a small house somewhere, and uh, some of the guys were talking about maybe they didn't have to perform too much, and Harley uh, stopped them in their tracks and said, you got to go out and work even harder because maybe you'll have a better house next time, you know, and, uh, and it really uh, meant a lot to those rookies like Brett and Dynamite Kid and them and made a hell of an impression. A guy like Harley right. was uh, telling him something like that. Yeah, I, I certainly can't say wow. enough about the integrity and uh, leadership of both of you guys. You guys are, you know, uh, well, and the whole you guys set the tone for uh, the a whole generation of, you know, the guys that came out of your territories are sort of a, a reflection of what you guys were all about. You know, so many legendary workers that uh, came out of uh, Amarillo and in uh, Kansas City, too, that you guys are the guys who sort of... Uh, set them on the right track. Terry and Dory and his father, all of them were as good as good ever thought about getting, and I was very, very honored to have any opportunity to be there with them. And vice versa, Harley. Tell me, Harley, you're uh, you're the guy who won the strap from Dory back in 73, or somewhere in there. That was, I think, the first time you came up for Stampede Week in... Uh, I know my, you made a huge fan of my dad. He was sort of like, uh, after that, you know, a, a huge Harley Race fan. And uh, I know it meant a hell of a lot to, uh, I'm not sure if some of the listeners heard this story, but I know after my mother passed, uh, Harley uh, dropped everything and came up to Calgary uh, and spent a couple of weeks with my dad, just hanging with him at the house. And uh, it meant an incredible amount to my dad that Harley, uh, you know, uh, saw fit to come up and just sort of be there for him and hang out with him and uh, whatever, you know, it really meant a, a lot to my dad. It made a hell of an impression on the rest of us, you know, it, you know, it tells you what kind of a guy Harley is. So. Well, I appreciate that, but Stu Hart was, to me, was one of the all-time greats you still talk about today worldwide. Yep. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I put uh, Dory Sr. in that same bunch. You know, they were kind of the uh, the guys that uh, made the business what it was. You know, they put their heart and soul into it, you know, and they uh, had a hell of a lot of integrity and respect for the business and uh, expected the wrestlers to uh, have that same respect. And I think that's the same thing with you and uh, Terry. You know, you have that same... Uh, high respect for the business and old school all the way. Well, that's it's what uh, fed me since I was 15 years old. And it's still involved in doing it today. Tell us, Harley, just for some of the listeners, uh, I remember you telling me way back with some of your a pretty tough journey for you to even get in with the old uh, the Zabiscos and old Happy Humphrey and some of that stuff. It was... It was uh, pretty tough too was paying just for you to get, even get into it yeah but uh that was the price that uh 99 percent of us had to pay back during that year it yeah was, a lot of people don't realize that you know it's, i remember the same up here the guys all had to go down to the dungeon and they had like Stu and luther Lindsay and george gordienko and gordon nelson and some of those old shooters uh taking them to task you know and uh stretching them and they had to go through that for you know months before they ever even anyone ever spoke about the working elements of the business and and you came up about as hard as anyone even though it was tough it was a way that i wanted to go and i was uh lucky uh to be one of the ones that uh made it and made it on a pretty good level to this day uh that's why we're on the phone here now. Uh, if I was Joe Blow or Tom Thumb, you wouldn't have me on the air uh, talking to you, right? No, well, and I, I think 
uh, and I think all of us and the and the wrestling business was lucky to have people with the integrity of a Harley Race and the Funks and and like like Terry said earlier, the Grams and the different families that and men and and that came into this business that really meant something. And and I know Harley has snuck it in there a couple times, but. We are on the air tonight on Heartbeat Radio with two of the all-time greats, two of the very best of the of best time, right here yeah. on Heartbeat Radio. Yeah, and one of the things that made them so great, Johnny, is uh, I know when Terry or a Harley Race or a Dory Funk Jr. would come up to our territory or any other territory, uh, they would go out and take whoever your local guy was, and sometimes your local guy wasn't that good, and... And they would make those guys look like world beaters and make them, in many cases, look way better than they ever had any right to look. And uh, they always left your territory in a lot better shape than when they came in, you know. And uh, that was the uh, the beauty of a Harley race and a Dory and a Terry Funk was they uh, they were good for business. You know, they uh, your business always would be better after they left, you know, and uh, they well, understood like that formula. Yeah, and like Terry just said, you know, it was their their main concern was every eighteen or twenty inches those chairs fit in. They wanted those chairs full, and and I'm sure yeah. that Terry and Terry and Harley would say that it didn't really matter if they were in the main event or not. If the if the chairs were full, everybody was getting paid. The one thing you wanted was was to leave it better. You wanted you to have there. a match that was so good. Yeah, and, and you guys always did that. Our business always would jump, you know, before you came in, and it would it would it would be better after. You know, our houses would always uh, jump after you guys left because you made our guys look like world beaters. You know, Harley would be up there taking the big high backdrops and uh, all the other, and a lot of those guys. Uh, even including my brother Brett and uh, some of those guys who are dynamite, and those guys are sort of, you know, pretty green rookies at the time. And uh, after having a match with one of you guys, all of a sudden their confidence was uh, 100% bigger, and they, they would go out and uh, their work. You know, I saw so many guys uh, after they worked with you guys, and uh, they were transformed into great workers after that. I remember even some of those guys like Les Thornton. You know, after they worked with you guys, all of a sudden they were like considered uh, the next level. You know, and uh, it was it was great for uh, them and great and, for the business. And at that time, you have to remember this: at that time, there was no choreography to wrestling. No, uh, we it was always. Uh, we went into the ring, and that, that was it. I remember that was, we said remember, that before. Uh, how many times? How many hundreds of people have Harley and I gone into the ring with that we've never seen before they came out of the dressing room door? And you guys would go out and have an hour Broadway or, uh, you know, a 10-star match with them. And, uh, you know, every, you know, like some guy you'd never met before, you know, and uh, which is a testimony. And there was never any script, you know. Somebody would give you a finish and say, hey, well, Harley, we did. Some of those guys, though, but some of those guys were good, too. Oh, they. Uh, those guys were all right. Some of them were. Oh, a lot of a lot, a lot of them were. A lot of those guys were uh, very good. The ones that weren't, uh, that's what we were paid uh, to do to get there to make them uh, pick up their uh, view of wrestling and uh, the people's view of them, and hopefully that's what we wound up doing. Oh, you guys did. Uh, yeah. You guys had some great workers like the Billy Robinsons and some of them to work with, but. I remember you guys had a few, a few like Klondike Bill and some of them, and you still uh, went out and uh, made them look like they, you know, were world beaters, or you know, they were, you know, an inch away from winning the world title and all like that. And I don't know, there's that many guys in the business today are capable of that. You know, my dad used yeah. to say anyone can get himself over, but uh, the great workers can go out and work with anyone and make them look good. You know, and that was uh, what you and Terry and Dory were. All about. I, I I remember I remember Terry or Dory telling me you need to be able to work with a broomstick and I and I don't want to I don't want to stop our conversation because I'm going to tell you it's an honor for me to be on tonight with everybody that's been on. Well, I appreciate it and I'm sure Terry does too. And just 
still being able to get on the air and talk about uh, wrestling and and what wrestling uh, should be and the three funks, the father, Dory, and Terry, you don't get any better than they were. And to be able to wrestle them, whether it be in Calgary or uh, Amarillo, uh, it was just uh, great to have people like that you could go into the ring with because you knew when you went in that ring, you were coming out of it with everybody in the building being satisfied with what they saw. Well, thank you, Harley. And and again, from the bottom of my heart and everybody listening tonight, thank you so much for calling in. God bless. And uh, uh, we enjoy having you on talking about wrestling the past and today and, and, and what you've done in it. Thank you so much. On behalf of all the Hart family, uh, nothing but uh, the highest regard and our uh, love. You know, you've been a, a great friend, and uh, I'd love to have you back any time. We just scratched the surface tonight. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Terry. Everybody tonight's been fantastic on the show. I got a couple little notes. First off, I got to read while everybody's here. Uh, from B. Brian Blair, tell Terry Funk he's one of my favorite human beings ever. That's from B. Byron Bear, and I also got to say on he's Jay the president Alito's of Cauliflorelli. Yes, sir. That? I know uh, he's a good man. He's working hard with that thing, and he's going to do good for it. Yeah, a good man, Brian Blair. Yes, he is, and he's going to do a good job with cauliflower. Thank you. I'm glad uh, we were able to. You know, I'm honored to have people like Harley and Ric Flair and Terry Funk, like three of the. Uh, all-time legends on tonight, so I, uh, I'd i like to thank them as well. You know, it's an incredible honor. And we, had a, we had a whole bunch of other guys, Terry, that were uh, clamoring to get on, to, uh, including Stan Hansen and Ted DiBiase and a bunch of others, so uh, oh even your old God. buddy Sylvester Stallone. So we'll, we'll maybe try to do it again another time, you know. I, I, uh, Sylvester can't thank- Stallone? Yeah, down down in Mexico or some damn thing, and so a whole bunch of them that were all clamoring to uh, really? come on. Where, yeah. does, where does your radio show go? Does it go all over? It's yeah, worldwide. we'll maybe uh, yeah. do a sequel, this like Rocky Two or whatever. So. Yeah, all the best, my friend. Thank you. All right, the best to your families too. Thank the you. Best. Good night, Bruce. We've done it again. I got to tell you, the list of people that wanted to call in is great, but the group that we had on was the best of the best, and I don't know how you can do any more than that. I'm thrilled that, uh, and honored that uh, you know people like Rick Flair climbed out of a sick bed, and Harley, and uh, and Terry, and JJ, and and Dave Meltzer. Again, just to have those three NWA World Champions, legendary. You know, not just yeah, like, just not part time. They were legendary guys. It's like Harley said. You know, that's three of the all time greats. You know, and there's no exaggeration or anything there. That was hundred percent truth. You know, those are about as iconic, uh, and maybe Dory Jr. You know, that was about as good as it gets. You know, so and and for all three of them to come on and and you know really listening to them they all said the same thing and i know you and i we, you and i talk about it on odd times but uh uh they all brought in the same thing that they were worried about putting butts in seats and it was about the business and it was about the work and it wasn't about any choreography it was about going out there and sort of Just making doing that, that on the fly that you know yeah. yeah yeah ad-libbing and uh you know going out and uh and always raising the bar higher, you know, and uh, we just scratched the surface. But I guess we're running out of time, so I'd just like to Absolutely. thank all the listeners out there and, uh, you know, hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. God bless and good night, everybody. May the circle be unbroken. Thank you. <laughs>